Now, Gabor, in uh, The Myth of Normal, you write about how you had a profound breakthrough yourself not that long ago in a series of ayahuasca journeys that resulted in, in you encountering, it sounded like, uh, some, some kind of deep taste, touch of your quote-unquote true self. And quite honestly, I, I understood the circumstances, and you can share that here with our audience, but I didn't quite get a clear picture of what the actual experience was that uh, was the breakthrough for you. So I wonder if you can share both the context, the experience, and at what level of transformational change really came from it. The context was uh, a retreat that I was going to lead in the Amazon jungle at a particular ayahuasca facility um, called the Temple of the Way of Light. And uh, professionals, physicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, came from all over the world to work under under the leadership of the well-known Dr. Gabor Mate, and they came from four continents, 23 of them. And uh, I worked with ayahuasca for, you know, over a decade by then, and I, I helped people formulate their intentions for the ceremony. And after ceremony, which I don't lead, that's led by shamans, ayahuascaros, I help people integrate their experience, understand their experience, interpret it. So, and I'm good at doing that. And so people came, paid big bucks to come from all over the world to the Amazon jungle. And the shamans, after one ceremony, they came to me and said, you can't take part here because you're too dense. There's something dark about you that interferes with our chanting that doesn't let our medicine penetrate into you. And your darkness even affects the other people. So essentially, they fired me from my own retreat. And they, you know, they, the rest of the ceremonies were done without me. And they assigned one shaman to work with me privately in five ceremonies over the next 10 days. So it was both a humbling and a liberating experience because I arrived there very stressed, overworked, and they were quite right. And, but furthermore, Tammy, they said, we sense two things about you, and you have to understand, they didn't know who I was, what I'd done, who I am in the world, my achievements, nothing. They just saw me as the person who was in front of them at that time, and they said, there's two things about you that we sense. One is that we think you worked with a lot of trauma in your life, and you, and you haven't cleared that out of yourself. And secondly, we think when you were very small, you had a big scare in your life, early in your life, and you haven't got over it yet. So that's the context. And, okay. And, and then what happened? So then this shaman worked with me for five ceremonies. I took the ayahuasca. He chanted. Um, he prayed over me. He put his hands on. He did energetic work. And gradually I unloosened. I became calmer, more present, uh, more grounded, uh, more grateful. And when the final ceremony was over, at least so I was, and I was feeling very clear and very grateful and great, glad for the experience and uh, appreciating both the wisdom of the shamans and appreciating also my own willingness to, to get fired and to, and to receive their healing. I thought it was finished and all of a sudden I was thrown on the mat by some force and then for the next two hours or more um, I just journeyed and this is where I have no words because I don't remember much of the journey except that I was gone far away. And I remember the vision at the end of it um, that I shared in the book where the Hungarian word, uh, now I don't think, I don't think in Hungarian and I don't dream in Hungarian. So this came from very deep within me and in a blue like sky in letters like wisps of cloud, the word Hungar the Hungarian word B O L D O G, uh, Bulldog, were spelled out. And I saw it in my eyes. And I realized that all that stuff that had happened to me need not define my existence. That all that had happened to my family, all that happens in the world, painful, distressing, tragic, traumatizing as it all can be, it doesn't have to define who I am or my future 
or my relationship to life, or my relationship to myself, or my relationship to anything. So it was a liberation from the past, is what it was. But that's the closest that I can come to describing it, because it would take a better poet than I am to, to give it words and some of the, you know, some of the great poets and spiritual teachers can find the right words. By the way, I'm not comparing my experience to. Sure. I'm just saying that I don't have the words to say much more about it besides what I've just shared or sharing the book, <clears throat> except to say I wouldn't want anybody to believe that I had that experience and I came back a changed man. I mean, I did have a glimpse of something, I had an opening to something, but believe me, two months later or a week after I got home from that trip, I started writing a book and I plunged right into despair. So it, 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 it was and it remains an essential experience for me. But again, you have to emphasize the importance of integration and constant reintegration of those experiences into our lives. And I think the same is true for any spiritual experience with or without psychedelics. And the Hungarian word that you saw spelled in the sky means? Happy. It means happy. There you go. Which is not a, not a word that easily came to my mind when I ever thought about myself, you know? No, probably not the first word uh, most people uh, w would use either uh, but for you. But there you go. Uh, uh, a gift to you. Happy in Hungarian. Now, as someone who knows a lot about uh, neurology and what's happening in our hormonal system, what was going on during these ayahuasca ceremonies in terms of creating this kind of access? And I'm particularly interested, Gabor, because most of us won't go to South America and spend X number of thousands of dollars and have experiences like this. But how can we understand the the template, if you will, of the human journey so that we can access this, this wisdom? Well, um, out of 33 chapters on the book, precisely one is on a psychedelic modality, because the last thing I want to come across as is some kind of psychedelic evangelist. I don't think they are the answer, and I don't overemphasize. I mean, out of the eight healing chapters in the book, one is on psychedelics. So I think there's much more to it than that. But specifically, when it comes to psychedelics, there's no magic about it. There's no um, mir uh, miracle about it. I describe the experience of a woman with severe, life-threatening, in fact, terminal autoimmune disease, who, based on her experience with psychedelics, has literally, she should have been dead years ago, according to the prognosis and her physical state prior to psychedelics. But the psychedelics opened for her a whole healing process that has her active and, and, and vital and creative right now, years later. So, but, and from the point of view of Western medicine, or at least not Western science, but Western medical practice, that's unexplainable. But there's nothing unexplainable about it, unexplainable about it when we understand the science. So I said earlier that mind and body can't be separated and physiology is related to psychology. And so, Freud said at one point that dreams are the royal road to the unconscious, which means that when you're dreaming, your unconscious just shows up, which is what happens. Because what happens in dream state is that the conscious brain is offline. And the parts of the brain that are charged with childhood emotional memories become suffused with blood. And so they become very active. And then the mind makes up stories to account for those emotions. So, for example, if you're dreaming that Nazis are chasing you and you're afraid, it's not true that you're afraid because Nazis are chasing you. It's more true to say that Nazis are chasing you because the emotion of fear has arisen in your brain because your control system is offline, your childhood memories are enlivened, and now the expression of fear that you suppress as a child now, now comes alive, and then your mind makes up a story to explain the fear. Much the same happens with psychedelics. So if dreams are the royal road to the unconscious, I would say psychedelics are even more of a royal road to the unconscious for the reason that under a psychedelic experience, 
that membrane between conscious and unconscious disappears. The unconscious floods into your awareness in the form of visions, in the form of um, stories, in the form of uh, deeply felt uh, emotions. And but you're there as an adult to witness it all and 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 to kind of work it through in a safe environment where you're guided by people who know what they're doing. And this is why the importance of environment and context, the setting is so important. And then if there's somebody like myself around the next day, then we can talk about it and you can actually interpret and integrate that experience even more deeply. So psychedelics so remove that membrane and at the same time, allow all that stuff that you've been suppressing to flood into your awareness. What, what can also flood into your awareness has happened with me in that very last experience with that picture in the sky that I talked about is your authentic self can show up, which has been covered under layers of suffering and layers of defenses and adaptations and so on. So you're in a position, ideally speaking, to both come to terms with your suffering that you had repressed, but also with that self that you had lost contact with. So that's kind of an idealized nutshell um, summation of the psychedelic experience when it works. Uh, there's different psychedelics, of course, you can't put them into one basket. That's ayahuasca with ibogaine, you'll have a different experience with MDMA, mushrooms, you'll have a different experience. But essentially common to them all is the lifting of the veil between the conscious and the unconscious.